Hello, and welcome to Morningstar's first quarter 2024 U.S. stock market outlook. My name is Susan Jabinski, and I'm an investment specialist with Morningstar.com. The U.S. stock market finished 2023 on a high note as the rally in stocks broadened and long-term interest rates pulled back after signs that the Federal Reserve was finished raising interest rates. So what should investors have on their radars for 2024? Here today to share their outlooks for the market and the economy are Dave Sakara, Chief U.S. Market Strategist for Morningstar Research Services, and Preston Caldwell, Chief U.S. Economist with Morningstar Research Services. So let's begin. Dave, over to you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our 2024 Market Outlook. So before I actually get into the slide deck, I just want to quickly address you know, what a return to normal means for stocks and why I titled that for our 2024 outlook. So in my opinion, I think 2024 is really the first year after the pandemic that we're going to be past all of the initial disruptions and then all of the dislocations caused by those disruptions from the pandemic. And I think about it really in two waves. So the first wave was in 2020 and 2021. So initially we had everybody, or at least all the office workers such as myself, you know, moving to a work from home environment. We had a lot of shut-ins, people were afraid to go back out in public. We saw a huge shift in consumer behavior and especially consumer spending. You know, spending shifted away from services and into goods. And then we had some of the largest monetary and fiscal stimulus programs you know, in history. The second wave then ended up being in 2022 and 2023. So we saw a lot of those you know, now turn into a lot of dislocations in the market and especially in the economy. So for example, we had all the supply chain bottlenecks, we had shortages, especially in semiconductor chips. We had you know, inflation really start ratcheting you know, much higher. And then the Fed, you know, after falling behind in the inflation fight, you know, had to then catch up and start raising you know, rent, uh, interest rates you know, very quickly. And so now when I'm thinking about 2024 and what we expect to going forward, you know, we're seeing a lot of those now really starting to subside. So for example, with the Federal Reserve, you know, monetary policy has been on pause. And in fact, we think they're gonna take you know, the foot off the brake and start easing monetary policy and getting back to more of a normalized environment. A lot of those supply chain disruptions have now eased. The shortages have also eased. So I think 2024 is going to be a year of really getting back to basics, really looking at a lot of individual company and sector fundamentals and getting away from a lot of those you know, macroeconomic and behavioral in, uh, catalysts that we had seen over the past couple of years. So let's turn to our outlook and our valuation here. So first, I'm just going to review our equity market valuation. I'll talk about sectors where we see value today, where we see your know, market probably overextended, highlight a couple of our equity analyst team top picks. We'll talk about valuation by economic moat. I'll then pass the baton over to Preston, who will review his economic outlook. I'll take control, review, and talk about the mega cap space. Really, that's been you know, one of the things that have really impacted the markets the most you know, and how those have swung you know, back and forth over the past couple of years. And then give a brief you know, overview of our fixed income outlook. And as Susan mentioned, we'll try and take as many questions as we can at the end. So here's where we are you know, today. So, you know, as Susan mentioned in the fourth quarter, I actually started off on the back foot. You know, in October, interest rates were rising. You know, the 10 year was getting you know, dangerously close to hitting 5%. Stock market was selling off, you know, especially those sectors that were most correlated to interest rates. But the market hit a bottom at the end of October. We saw the Santa Claus rally, which typically comes in December, you know, come early in November. We started seeing you know, interest rates moving back down. We started seeing you know, the stock market you know, move back up. And then in December, that rally continued after the Fed meeting. So market really interpreted a lot of the commentary by Federal Reserve Chair Powell, really not only indicating that you know, we're at the point now that the Fed has not only paused, but is probably starting to look and think about when it's going to start easing. So at this point, as much as the market has rallied, we're now back to fair value. So our price to fair value metric is at one at the end at December 21st. So what that indicates is when we look at all of those stocks that we cover, you know, it's over 700 stocks that trade on U.S. exchanges, and we compare our valuations, you know, of the market cap of those stock versus our intrinsic valuation, you know, we're trading, you know, right at fair value. Now, the good part is for long-term investors, we still do see undervalued opportunities in the marketplace today. So when we break it down by the Morningstar style box, I would note that value stocks 
are still trading at a pretty respectable uh, discount from fair value, trading at about a 10% discount, whereas, you know, core stocks and growth stocks, you know, trading slightly above fair value at this point. And then when we break it down by capitalization, you know, small cap stocks are still undervalued. We still see a lot of opportunities for investors in that space. And then also would note that mid cap stocks are also slightly undervalued, whereas large cap stocks with as much as they've rallied you know, over the past year, are starting to move slightly into you know, overvalued territory. So as far as allocations today, you know, in my view, based on these valuations, I do think investors should still be overweight that value category probably slightly underweight core and growth, probably more underweight core in order to be able to pay for you know, that overweight in the value category. And by capitalization, you know, I also think you can probably be slightly underweight that large category in order to overweight you know, the small cap category and a slight overweight in that mid cap category you know, as well. You know, just taking a look at how our price to fair value metric, you know, has performed, you know, versus the market over time. You know, anecdotally, I think this really helps illustrate, you know, how our long term focus on valuation really can help investors, you know, identify those times when the market becomes, you know, overextended, you know, either too far to the upside or trades, you know, down too far to the downside compared to that long term view. So most recently, you can see that sell-off in September and October, you know, taking the market down to you know, just under you know, 0.9 times at the end of October, and then rallying you know, right back up in November and December and getting us you know, back to fair value. But you can also see too, you know, at the beginning of 2022, you know, we noted we thought that the market was overvalued you know, coming into the year that year. Not only did the market then sell off, it actually sold off way too much to the downside, you know, bottoming out in October 2022, getting to, you know, some of the most undervalued levels that we've seen, you know, since the, uh, you know, the global debt crisis and, you know, going all the way back to 2011 when we had the European sovereign debt crisis with, you know, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, as well as a lot of concern back then about, you know, whether or not some of those countries would default and the impact it could have on the, uh, the European banking system. You know, the other thing I would note too here is that, you know, in fourth quarter, we're starting to see gains, you know, broaden out away from just being the Magnificent Seven. So the Magnificent Seven, you know, they accounted for 75% of the market return at the end of June, but by the end of the year it was only 52% of the return. And I think that's going to be a trend, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the next couple of slides, you know, for what we see, you know, going forward. Now, as far as near-term risks to the market, you know, I am watching, you know, we do have earnings, you know, starting up at the end of this week with the big banks, and then we'll see how they continue over the course of the month and into February and March. I am concerned that we could see management teams maybe look to lower the bar as far as guidance for the first quarter and for you know, all of you know, 2024. So as we'll talk about, you know, we do expect that the rate of economic growth will slow not only here in the fourth quarter at the end of last year, but for the next three quarters, all the way until the third quarter of this year before then starting to reaccelerate. So I do think a lot of teams you know, might try and use this opportunity to lower that guidance expectation you know, in the marketplace. And of course, that could drive some negative market sentiment here in the near term. However, if that does occur, that's probably actually going to be a good buying opportunity and maybe even move into you know, an overweight position in equities, just depending on how far the market you know, could potentially sell off. You know, just taking a look at you know, how the market performed you know, here in the fourth quarter, relatively strong in the fourth quarter. I think really the takeaway here is looking at you know, by the different categories, you know, growth stocks still did outperform you know, in the fourth quarter, but they outperformed by much less of a margin that they had outperformed you know, over the course of the full year. And I expect to going forward based on our valuations that we'll see you know, better returns in the value category and start seeing you know, more of a, a condensation of the market as far as you know, getting back towards more of a normalized pattern as far as returns you know, by category. Then I'd also note in the fourth quarter, we saw some pretty good performance out of the small cap category as well as the mid cap category, you know, both of those slightly outperforming um, the large cap category. And then just taking a look at you know, how our uh, valuations you know, evolved over the course of the year. You know, coming into the year, we thought the market was significantly undervalued, trading at about a 16% discount to our fair values. You know, at that point in time, we actually were recommending a barbell-shaped portfolio, being overweight both value and overweight growth with an underweight in core. And we were also then looking for an overweight you know, in that small and the mid-cap space as well. Now, over the course of the year, when growth stocks you know, really you know, 
rallied in the first half of the year. We then moved to a market weight in the growth category as it got towards fair value. It went slightly above fair value in the fall. We actually moved to an underweight in growth. And then with the way that the valuations in the market then uh, evened out over the course of the fourth quarter, you know, we're now looking more for a market weight in growth, maybe slight underweight with more of an underweight in core, but keeping that overweight in the value category. And of course, you know, keeping the overweight in the small cap stocks you know, as well. You know, quarter to date sector returns, you know, I would note here everything was up except energy. Energy was the only sector that fell, you know, over the course of the fourth quarter with some weakness, you know, in the oil markets. Uh, and I would say that the stocks that are tied to the economy actually performed, you know, the best. So again, taking a look at how those returns panned out, seems like the market is coming around to our point of view, uh, as Preston and you will talk about. I think, you know, we've long been looking for, you know, that soft landing, you know, here in 2024. So those sectors that are most, you know, correlated to the economy performed very well. And of course, some of those sectors that were undervalued performing, you know, very well as well. Where sectors that were pretty fully valued coming into the quarter in the fourth quarter were the the ones that did not perform as well, the consumer defensive, the healthcare, you know, were lagging behind what we saw in more of the cyclical sectors. And then looking at, you know, returns year to date, I think the real takeaway here is looking at those three sectors that we had identified at the beginning of last year as being the most undervalued were the ones that saw, you know, by far the strongest gains, you know, over the course of the year. You know, technology stocks being up, you know, over 59%, you know, year to date, that was one of the most undervalued sectors coming into the year. You know, communication services, you know, up 55% year to date. Again, that was the most undervalued sector coming into the year. And then consumer cyclicals also being one of the three most undervalued coming into the year, having very strong returns, you know, as well. You know, those sectors that we thought were overvalued, such as energy, you know, just barely being able to, you know, stay in positive territory. And then sectors like consumer defensive, healthcare, utilities, you know, sectors that were fully valued last year, you know, barely keeping positive for defensives, you know, and healthcare and utilities, you know, actually trading down for the year, which actually is now making that look uh, very attractive to us going forward. Getting back to the Magnificent Seven, you know, just want to identify you know, how much these stocks and how much they went up over the course of the year. And of course, because of their index weightings, you know, really skewed that overall market return. You know, for the first half of the year, when we did an attribution analysis, you know, 75% of the total market return was just from these stocks you know, alone. But we are starting to see them you know, run out of steam. When we take a look at the valuations you know, for those stocks, at the beginning of the year, six of seven were either rated four or five stars, meaning that we thought they were significantly undervalued. You know, at this point, you know, only Alphabet, the parent of Google, is still undervalued as a four-star rated stock. And in fact, we also think Apple has run too far to the upside. That's now a two-star rated stock. You know, the other stocks now being rated three stars. So looking forward, you know, we're looking for you know, mostly you know, market performance for most of these stocks, still a little bit of upside left you know, in Alphabet and Apple you know, might be actually a good time to be looking to take some profit you know, in that stock you know, today. So again, I do not suspect that these stocks really are gonna drive the market anywhere near this year as what we've seen you know, last year. This is probably gonna be the last time I show this slide. Uh, so we've highlighted this you know, a number of times, just this monetary tightening policy cycle you know, had been the steepest and fastest you know, over the past 40 years. You have to go back to you know, the 70s and the 80s to see the Fed you know, move further and faster than what we've had at this point. Uh, we do think that the Fed is gonna start easing monetary policy you know, this year, possibly as soon as the March meeting. So going forward, we'll probably start looking at the opposite. We'll probably start looking at you know, what's happened in prior Fed cycles as they've been you know, easing rates and how fast they've eased rates you know, in the past. Uh, inflation, inflation is probably going to be our biggest uh, out of consensus call, I think, compared to the rest of the marketplace. You know, Preston will go into this you know, in great depth you know, in his section here as far as you know, how he's looking at inflation. But I think the takeaway here is just to look at, you know, we are expecting you know, inflation on average to be about 2% over the course of this year. We think inflation not only will continue to moderate this year, but continue to keep falling you know, into 2025 as well, you know, getting below the Fed's 2% target. And as far as the economy goes, again, Preston will go into this in much greater depth, but we do expect the high interest rates, restrictive monetary policy and tight lending you know, is gonna to continue to keep taking its toll. So we are looking for you know, slower growth in the fourth quarter as compared to the third quarter. 
and then sec slowing sequentially each of the next three quarters until the third quarter before it bottoms out and starts to reaccelerate back up to the upside. And then I threw two new slides in this quarter. I thought this was instructive just to show for, you know, by capitalization, how our fair values, you know, have compared to each of those capitalization categories, you know, over time. So you can see, you know, back in like 2011 through, you know, 2016, you know, even into 2018, you know, how tight those different categories were as compared to one another. And you really see the big dislocations, you know, starting at the beginning of the pandemic, just how much, you know, small cap stocks, you know, really sold off and how undervalued they became, you know, as compared to the rest of the market. And then to the upside, you know, still lagging behind. Same with the mid cap stocks, you know, lagging to the upside here, you know, most recently. And then doing you know, the same analysis for each of the different you know, categories of value, core, and growth, you know, showing just how much that value category is still lagging to the upside on a valuation basis. Whereas in the past, you know, we haven't seen you know, necessarily these kind of dislocations you know, in the past other than a couple of other instances, but then usually have uh, largely corrected over time. So with that, let's just turn over here to sector valuations. So overall, while the stock market itself may be broadly at fair value, we still see a lot of opportunities you know, in individual stocks. So in this case, you know, we still see a lot of stocks uh, by percentage of stocks that we cover you know, in that undervalued territory. You know, probably around 35, 36% are still you know, four and five star rated stocks. However, you know, by sector, you know, while some of the sectors have a high percentage of undervalued stocks, you know, some of the more overvalued sectors such as industrials and technology, you know, fewer opportunities by percentage of coverage and uh, starting to see you know, a higher percentage of that covered now in overvalued territory rated either one or two stars. So here's where we are today as far as you know, price to fair value by individual sector. So let's just start off uh, to the downside. Technology stocks, you know, following that 59% return last year, has definitely moved into the overvalued territory in our view. Now trading at a 9%, you know, premium to our fair value. So this is a sector, you know, over the course of last year, you know, we started off as an overweight, went to a market weight, uh, ended up, I think, going to an underweight at one point, back to a market weight, and now back to an underweight you know, based on valuations. Industrials also moving into that overvalued territory. And then consumer cyclical, you know, kind of same as technology with as much as it moved up last year, now getting into that slightly overvalued territory. So all three sectors I think are probably ripe for investors you know, to look through what you own there, look at what you own on a valuation basis, maybe pare down, take some profits you know, where you can, and look to reinvest that into some of these other sectors that we still think are undervalued. So communication services, the most undervalued sector, trading at about an 11% discount to fair value. And of course, that's gonna be heavily weighted by Alphabet. I believe that's over 40% of the index. So again, that's trading at about a 16% discount to fair value. It's a four-star rated stock. So that does skew that overall sector you know, lower, but we do see a lot of opportunities, even in more traditional media and communication names there. Some of the other sectors that are undervalued, I would note real estate and uh, the energy sector, both trading at an 8% discount, so names that we think are undervalued there. Uh, energy you know, was one of the more overvalued sectors last year. It's fallen enough. We see enough opportunities here that this would be a good area to overweight today. And real estate, I think, not only a good overweight because a lot of those commercial real estate names got pushed down too far based on concerns of valuation for urban office space. But again, it's fallen you know, too far that there are good opportunities there. And then lastly, uh, basic materials and the utility space. Uh, utilities got pushed on really hard last October when interest rates were going up. Utilities actually got to some of the most undervalued area that we've seen you know, since the uh, global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. It's moved up, but we still think that has further to go as well. And we'll talk about the basic material sector, number of different opportunities there. Uh, a lot of the agricultural commodities and the uh, commercial um, Chemicals in that space are undervalued, but also lithium. You know, lithium was pretty much in a bubble in 2021 and early 2022. You know, that bubble has since popped, but we think it's popped too far to the downside. So again, we do think that lithium is going to be undersupplied over the next decade. We see a lot of demand coming. So that's another good name. And now one other area in basic materials I don't think I've highlighted in the past is going to be the gold miners. So we'll talk about what we like in the gold miners and why we think there's you know, upside opportunity there today. 
So in our cyclicals, uh, I've highlighted here uh, the names that are new uh, from our equity analyst team as far as our best picks for this quarter. So FMC is a new top pick. Uh, that's a company that's you know, heavily invested in crop chemicals. So that's one that we see you know, some upside here in the market, trading at a very large margin of safety from our intrinsic valuation. And then Newmont Mining, you know, the largest gold miner out there, I think has a lot of significant uh, upside leverage. So even based on our assumptions today, we think it's trading at about a 22% discount to fair value. Now, it is a no-moat stock, but the reason I like this one specifically is when you look at our assumptions for gold prices, for the next two years, we assume the gold prices actually come down. They average about 1865 you know, per ounce through 2025, and then gold prices are modeled to fall even further into you know, the $1,700 and change range you know, over the next two years thereafter through 2027. Gold, of course, right now is over $2,000 an ounce. So if gold prices actually were to stay here or even rise from here, I think there's a lot of upside leverage in the gold miners. And even if gold prices fall down to our expectations in our model, you're still buying the stock at a 22% discount. So I do think that one's you know, a very interesting play today. Uh, Hasbro, another new name to the list. Yeah, that one has been under some short-term pressures, but we do think the market's over-extrapolating those short-term pressures too far into the future. And then lastly, Realty Income. Realty Income is a, a triple net lease provider in the REIT space. This is the one that actually when our analyst team has done a correlation analysis with the REIT coverage as compared to interest rates, has the highest correlation to interest rates. Now, Preston will go over his interest rate outlook, but I would note here is this is the one that we do think probably has the best upside leverage to interest rates coming down. Even if interest rates you know, stay where they are today, again, it's going to be a high dividend paying stock that you're buying at about a 25% discount to fair value. Number of different new names on the economically sensitive list, uh, Comcast, again, another name that's been under pressure. We think the market is, just has you know, overly negative sentiment in this name. Uh, we do think that broadband growth you know, over time will be a benefit for this company and help their operating margins you know, over time. Uh, APA is going to be our pick as far as the, uh, the smaller, more regional you know, energy names for the exploration and production space. But uh, on the, uh, the large side for the global majors, uh, ExxonMobil is going to be our pick there. And a couple of new names uh, in the industrial space between Allegion, CNH, and RTX uh, for investors to look at. Yeah, I'd recommend going to Morningstar.com or whichever Morningstar platform you use and do some additional reading you know, on these names and learn you know, why we think the market uh, is uh, misvaluing these stocks today. And then lastly, moving uh, to our defensive sector best picks, uh, WK Kellogg, Tyson, and WEC, uh, new names uh, this quarter. WK Kellogg, this is one actually Susan and I talked about on our last uh, morning show on Monday mornings. I really think this is an interesting opportunity for investors today, especially investors really to dig in, uh, do some due diligence on this name. This is a stock that I really think has kind of been orphaned in the marketplace today. When I look at the situation here, uh, Kellogg split up last year into two different businesses, into Kellanova and WK Kellogg. So Kellanova is the larger of the two. It's the one that owns the snacks business from the prior Kellogg. That's the one that has all the high growth products, all the higher margin products. It's a much larger market cap. But the WK Kellogg spinoff, very small company, I believe it's a billion and change you know, in market cap. It's the legacy cereal business, a lot of negative sentiment for the cereal as just being a slow growth, very mature business. But we do see a lot of upside opportunity here. It pays a very healthy dividend at this point. And we do think being spun off from the broad company will actually pay dividends for this company in the future. We expect a lot of new product innovation will be able to help this company be able to start generating us some better growth over time. And the company is spending a lot of money in operational efficiency improvements today, which we think will pay off and help improve its margins you know, over the next several years as well. And then in the utility space, just moving to a WC Energy, you know, this is just one where you know, we think it has you know, some of the best in class management, has above average growth opportunities as compared to some of the other utilities, and then it's a very constructive regulatory environment. So another good one I think investors should take a look at today. Just wrapping things up by economic moat, you know, economic smoke stocks with wide economic moats, you know, did very well this year, you know, brought it up to now really being at fair value. 
Still some opportunities in the small cap in the value space here as well, but certainly not you know, the plethora of values that we saw you know, more than a year ago in the wide moat space. Some opportunity in the narrow moat, and then the better opportunity from a you know, category perspective is going to be in that no moat space. Now, however, I would note, you know, if you are looking in that no moat space, just make sure that if you are going to be involved in those stocks, you are looking for stocks that are going to be at a wide margin of safety to their intrinsic valuation. You know, the concern here is that, you know, if we do have a recession, you know, those would be the stocks that I would expect to fall, you know, the furthest and the fastest, you know, to the downside. Having said that, you know, there's a price for everything. So there are certainly opportunities, you know, to take a look at, you know, in that space as well. Not going to go through these names, but you know, I like to do this every quarter, just showing how you can use you know, some of the Morningstar tools in order to help you know, look for new investment ideas you know, for your portfolios you know, and identify stocks that might fit within your risk parameters you know, based on your portfolio. So in this case, I just look for you know, large cap stocks, those that we rate with a wide economic moat, and really look for those that have a lower medium uncertainty rating, and then just at a rank order on price to fair value for most undervalued you know, on up. Similar analysis for mid cap stocks. And then lastly, looking at undervalued small cap stocks. Now, not nearly as many small cap stocks have a wide moat. So in this case, I also include those stocks that we believe have a narrow economic moat. And in this case, you can see too, there are no wide moat stocks that we currently rate with a, a four or five star rating, but a whole host of stocks here with a narrow moat, with a medium uncertainty, and uh, one utility that has a low uncertainty rating. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn the baton over here to Preston to do his uh, economic outlook for 2024 and beyond. Thanks, Dave. Good morning, everyone. So jumping right in, um, it was widely expected that the Fed's rate hikes, the largest in 40 years, would slow GDP growth in 2023, with a majority of economists even expecting recession. Obviously, that hasn't panned out. Uh, while rate hikes have hit housing and a few other pieces of the economy, overall GDP growth has remained resilient owing to several factors, um, including free spending consumers and also a manufacturing building boom and some other factors I'll talk about. Um, yet, despite resilient GDP growth in 2023, uh, we still believe that the impact of higher interest rates has yet to fully play out. So in, insofar as uh, Fed policy remains somewhat restrictive throughout 2024 as a whole, even as they start to ease on interest rates, uh, we do expect growth to slow in 2024. Uh, before bouncing back sequentially in 2025, uh, you can sh see that show up in the annual numbers starting in 2026 and 2027, uh, which would be a response to easing of monetary policy. And on the inflation front, after inflation in 2022 reached its highest levels in 40 years, uh, with supply constraints combining with excess demand to drive up prices, uh, inflation has fallen dramatically in 2023 because those self-same supply constraints have alleviated and, and also the Fed's rate hikes have de moderated demand somewhat. So as a result, inflation uh, has fallen back greatly and um and by 2024, we expect inflation to come back to the Fed's 2% target. Um, comparing our views to consensus um, on the GDP growth front, we're pretty close to consensus in the near term. Although on a five-year time horizon, we do expect a cumulative 3% more real GDP growth than consensus owing to uh, principally our views on the supply side of the economy in terms of uh, labor force expansion and also productivity growth. And on inflation, uh, you can see that, you know, consensus is eventually expecting inflation return to that normal of 2%, but we're expecting it to happen even faster and even dip below the Fed's 2% inflation target a bit over uh, 2025 to 2027, as you can see. Uh, and so in our view, that more rapid fall in inflation will push the Fed to to cut rates uh, by further than the market and consensus are currently expecting. Our views uh, on interest rates here, these this chart shows annual averages. 
for for key U.S. interest rates. And as I mentioned, we expect the Fed to cut uh, starting this year and and proceed aggressively over the course of this year, heading into 2025, uh, wrapping up cuts by 2026. And that will drive that that lower federal funds rate will drive the 10 year Treasury yield uh, ultimately down to our long term projection of 2.75 percent. Uh, down from current levels of 4%. Um, and of course, we were as high as 5% just a couple months ago. Um, that will be needed to drive lower borrowing costs throughout the economy, including a fall in the 30-year mortgage rate, which we expect to ultimately fall to 4.25%, just uh, a bit above pre-pandemic levels. Uh, that will be needed um, ultimately to sustain a broad economic recovery. I think in housing, uh, you know, to even prevent housing from taking another leg down, uh, not to mention actually recover, uh, a, a substantial fall in, in mortgage rates is is needed. Uh, most homeowners or most new home buyers right now, I think, are kind of banking on being able to refinance a couple years down the line. And so if that if that option uh, diminishes in, in possibility because the Fed doesn't ease monetary policy substantially, then I do expect um, home home buying demand to diminish further. So zooming in on, on the near term, uh, so in the third quarter, we saw GDP growth surge to 4.9%. Now, there were several temporary factors at play. We saw Inventories contribute 130 basis points, which is very large and obviously won't repeat next quarter. Uh, government spending also contributed 100 basis points uh, to growth. Um, you know, throughout this year, actually, government spending has been a substantial tailwind um, with um, a little over 50 percent of that actually coming from state and local governments. One area that, you know, isn't usually highlighted, I'd say. Uh, so state and local governments were still running a slight surplus last year um, at 0.7% of GDP in 2022, and they flipped to a deficit of 0.8% uh, year to date, 2023. And so that's more of a normal level of uh, in terms of a state and local government budget balance. So that's one factor that played out in 2023 to help um, push up growth, and, and, and that won't repeat in 2024 because it's played out. Likewise, um, non-residential structures investment was up 16% um, year over year as of the third quarter. And so that helped to support private fixed investment despite the contraction in, in housing. Um, that non-residential structures investment is driven by this manufacturing building boom, which has been spurred by the CHIPS Act and the IRA. Um and and that's a factor that's going to plateau in impact, and so it won't continue to push up growth going into 2024. Uh, in the fourth quarter, we expect 1.7% real GDP growth uh, quarter over quarter. Um, uh, the Atlanta Fed's GDP now is at 2.2%. Consensus is about 1.1%. So, you know, growth should normalize in the fourth quarter. And then in 2024, we expect growth to slow. Um, not only you know, will the factors that I mentioned propelling GDP growth in 2023 subside? But also, I expect uh, consumers to get more conservative um, and the effects of high interest rates to play out in a variety of arenas. So, um, for example, uh, commercial real estate is a great example where really the um, the impact of high interest rates on, on uh, building of commercial real estate structures has yet to register at all. Uh, but credit provision to um, or credit growth in commercial real estate is in the midst of slowing. And so um, that will have a, a negative impact on, on um, uh, commercial real estate projects over the next year. Turning to the labor market, um, we saw um, actually uh, – disregard the top bullet point on this slide because um, we had a, um, a jobs report just this last Friday and non-farm payroll employment growth actually was 1.3% in the last three months. 
um, in the three months ending in December. So that's a slight slowdown from the 1.7% the in the prior three months. So we're still seeing job growth trend down barely. It's not the downtrend that we saw in 2022. Um, however, you know, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the slowdown in job growth is uh, starting to cease. We do think that with GDP growth slowing down further in 2024, that that will cause job growth to slow further. Um, and indeed, we're already seeing employers cut back on, on hours. So hours, average hours per worker uh, is down about 0.6% year over year. And so, you know, eventually the, um, the cutback in hours will, you know, uh, uh, reach the end of its rope and, and employers were, will likely um, increase the amount of layoffs, which has remained very low thus far. Turning to our labor market forecasts, um, the slowdown in GDP growth that we're expecting for 2024 will generate a modest uptick in unemployment, averaging 4.2% that year and also in 2025. Uh we think it'll peak unemployment will peak at about 4.5 percent in the fourth quarter of 2024 so yeah that is quite mild compared to historical increases in the unemployment rate it's not surprising given that we don't expect a recession to happen however insofar as unemployment does remain slightly elevated in 2025 that will be one reason that the fed will continue to cut in 2025 uh, in our view, even even as GDP growth starts to reaccelerate again, on the wage growth front, looking at the bottom chart, uh, our composite measure of wage growth showed four point seven percent year over year growth in the third quarter. So that's consistent with inflation at three point two percent. If we assume one hundred fifty basis points of productivity growth, so we're really um, you know, by by the time we get to um, the end of this year and we have further slowdown in the labor market, that should be sufficient to push wage growth all the way back down to normal, back down to a level that's consistent with two percent inflation. Uh, a bit more detail on consumption. So that's been, um, you know, one major factor helping to keep. Um, uh, GDP growth strong in 2023. Uh, consumers have actually uh, uh, decreased their savings rates uh, back down below pre-pandemic levels. Uh, they saved just 4% of their personal income in the third quarter compared to a pre-pandemic rate of 7.4%. Um, and so that's been facilitated by the fact that consumers uh, saved so much back early during the pandemic. So they built up these stockpiles of excess savings. Now, how much excess savings are left is uh, dependent on, you know, how you model excess savings. There's a few different, there's many different methodologies, ways to do that. But, you know, if we look, looking at the bottom chart, if we take the 2019 savings rate and, it, and extrapolate that forward, then the amount of excess savings has dwindled substantially and will run out sometime by mid to late 2024 this year. Um, so, you know, if that turns out to be correct, then we'll see savings rates very likely um, rise substantially over this year. Even if it's not correct, I do think consumers will, um, if, if there's more excess savings, uh, given that those are estimated to be concentrated among higher income households. Nonetheless, I would expect consumers to still increase those savings rates at least somewhat in 2024. And that's going to be one uh, major factor that will slow consumption growth and thus overall GDP growth. So on inflation, we saw the uh, CPI at 3.1% year over year in, in November. That's down precipitously from 8.9% uh, at, at its peak in, in June of 2022. Much of that decline has been driven by, by energy. Um, energy prices, of course, uh, spiked in 2022 owing, owing to the fallout from the Ukraine war, among other factors. Uh, and they've come back down substantially this year. But we're also now starting to see substantial progress on core inflation. In other words, stripping out food and energy prices. 
which is important given that core inflation is uh, generally seen to be a better measure of, of underlying uh, of inflation's underlying trend. So we saw core CPI inflation at 3.4% annualized in the last three months. Actually, core PCE inflation was just 2.2%. So as a reminder, the, the PCE is a separate index. It's the one that uh, the Fed focuses upon focuses upon and, and really is our focus as well because it represents a broader um, sample of consumer spending. Uh, the reason why core is uh, core PCE is running lower than core CPI right now principally is because the PCE has a lower weighting to housing because it includes more consumer spending. And actually core PCE was just 1.9% annualized in the last six months. So really, we're getting quite close to um, being able to declare victory on the inflation front uh, from that perspective. And and um, our projection is that core PCE will hit 2% year over year by the second quarter of this year. So once once you've hit your inflation target on a year over year basis, that's a long enough string of success that I think the Fed will feel quite comfortable cutting rates aggressively. Um, throughout the second half of 2024. So um, more on our, on our inflation forecast, um, we're expecting, um, <clears throat> you know, a durable goods deflation to continue over the next several years as this impact of normalization of supply chains plays out. Housing inflation, which has remained high this year, we expect to uh, normalize next year and further in 2025. Um, housing inflation recently was 6.7% year over year. But if we look just at uh, rent growth among new tenants, it was up only 2.7% year over year. So um, housing inflation is kind of a weighted uh, average of lagged new tenant rent growth. And so as long as that remains in place, which it should, given the expansion and housing supply, then it's really inevitable that housing inflation returns to normal. Um, so we're expecting our first cut in March, which is now the the market consensus. Um, we've we've expected this March cut for for quite some time, and now the just recently within the last month or so, the markets come around to our point of view. We expect one skip in May, but then cuts in June and every other meeting through the end of this year. In the near term, our views are, as you can see, uh, expecting a, a 3.75 to 4 percent target range at the end of 2024. That's right in line with what the market's now expecting. But there is still a divergence between our view and the market going into 2025, where uh, in, in our view, inflation remaining still below the Fed's 2 percent target uh, or pushing below the Fed's 2 percent target uh, and, and unemployment being slightly elevated. Um, I think all of that will cause the Fed to continue to cut throughout 2025 and, and eventually push rates essentially back down to pre-pandemic levels. And, you know, we have seen bond yields fall substantially going from the 10 year going from around 5 percent back in early November to now at about 4 percent. But, you know, that that uh, loosening of financial conditions, as we call it, will only persist so long as the Fed continues to or really actually starts to loosen monetary policy because that expectation of lower federal funds rate is what is federal funds rates is what is driving bond yields lower. So um, I'm actually uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip these sections right here. Um, and I'm going to wrap up with this slide right here. Um, here we chart year-over-year -year real GDP growth versus inflation. And, and we uh, graph four different economic regimes. So our base case is a soft landing. As you can see, our forecast put us into soft landing territory, which entails positive real GDP growth, even while inflation goes back to the 2% target. Uh, and we're expecting that to unfold over 2024 and 2025. Now, what I will say is that, you know, a year ago, everyone was worried about stagflation. That is uh, inflation remaining high, even as real GDP growth shrank. That scenario clearly has um, been invalidated by the fact that 
Inflation has come down so much, 300 basis points, even while real GDP growth has accelerated this year. And that's been driven by supply side expansion. But there still is some risk of, of two scenarios relative to our base case. One is a major recession scenario um, where you know the, the impact of Fed rate hikes plays out suddenly with great force. And then the other is an overheating scenario where there is no further impact of Fed rate hikes, and we also see consumers become uh, increasingly optimistic. Even as you know, you know, right now they're spending as if they're very optimistic, but there's you know room for sentiment to increase further. Maybe even asset markets become overheated, and you see a rebound in housing despite high interest rates. That would make the overheating scenario play out. So there's still you know two possible scenarios that we see um, that risk our base case. But for right now, we're uh, quite confident in in the soft landing scenario playing out. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up my section. Um, be on the lookout. I'll be holding a full uh, hour length webinar dedicated to uh, my economic views on February 27th. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dave Sequeira. Great. Thank you, Preston. Now, in the interest of time, I do want to get through these uh, next couple of slides as quickly as I can. I see a lot of questions, uh, some really good questions here coming in from the audience. So, you know, please feel free to keep putting those in. We will get to as many of those as possible. You know, just taking a look at the mega caps, I think just, you know, the real quick takeaways here, you know, looking at those that were most, you know, undervalued coming into 2022. And in fact, you know, high correlation with a lot of these mega caps here being with the Magnificent Seven, you know, how much they've run up, only a couple of them, you know, still being undervalued at this point. You know, the new names to our list uh, from last quarter, you know, a number of uh, pretty high quality names now that are in here. And, you know, I think that with the Magnificent Seven last year, really taking all the oxygen out of the room, you know, a lot of institutional managers, you know, just trying to keep up with, you know, the market rally, probably moving, you know, money and rotating out of some of these, you know, high quality, but maybe lower growth names, you know, into the Mag 7, you know, has left these behind, you know, Exxon, J&J, &J, Pepsi, Thermo, you know, all, you know, wide moat stock, you know, companies that I think are very high quality that, you know, are probably worth taking a look at today. You know, on the overvalued side, you know, those stocks that we identified as being overvalued coming into 2023, you know, for the most part have all sold off. The one I'd really highlight here is going to be Eli Lilly. So Eli Lilly up, you know, over 50% uh, year to date. Again, this is a stock that really ramped up much higher because of its weight loss drugs. You know, a lot of market excitement as far as, you know, the total addressable market size for those weight loss drugs. You know, and I would note too, when I look at our model and I talk to Damien who covers this name for us, you know, he, in his model, he even says his assumptions he thinks are higher than the average consensus for the weight loss drug. But even then, it's still a two-star rated stock, still trading well above our fair value estimate. So if this is a name you're involved in, I do think now is a good time to at least, you know, take some money off the table, lock in some of those profits, you know, at this point. But other than that, you know, Home Depot being the only other one, you know, to the upside, everything else having traded down. A couple of new names, you know, to the list, you know, Broadcom, again, that wasn't one of the Magnificent Seven, wasn't quite large enough to make you know, the cut there. But again, you know, a stock that really rallied you know, high last year, now moving into that overvalued territory. Costco, great company, you know, strong name, wide economic moat. But again, we just think the market is, you know, overextended, Netflix and Accenture uh, being the other two others. And then just wrapping up with a quick, you know, fixed income outlook, you know, returns last year, much more, you know, normal than what we've seen, you know, after the worst bond market ever in 2022. And using, you know, Preston's uh, interest rate forecast here. And for people that are interested, uh, we did publish our uh, 2024 bond market outlook a couple of weeks ago. That's available on whichever Morningstar platform you use. But again, you know, mid last year in our mid year uh, outlook, we did note that we were starting to recommend moving to a longer duration profile in fixed income. Uh, we still believe that being in the longer duration is probably the right part of the curve to go. A lot of the reasoning behind that is that we do expect interest rates, you know, will deaccelerate, come down this year and into 2025 and 2026. So I think it's a combination of two things. One, you're able to lock in what we think are, you know, relatively attractive rates in the longer end of the curve today. Plus, you know, over time, as interest rates come down, you'll get better price appreciation in those longer duration bonds. And then lastly, just looking at the corporate bond market, really not all that enthused about corporate bonds. 
I think it's probably a neutral at best at this point. You know, last year we saw a lot of you know attractive opportunities, both in investment grade and high yield. You know, investment grade has tightened 18 basis points. You know, we're sub 100 spread in investment grade today. You know, high yield 338 as of December 21st. Again, I think you're getting paid an adequate amount based on our economic outlook. But I don't think you're getting any excess return you know, at this point. I think you're getting paid for the downgrade risk and default risk, but there's really not a lot of extra upside here from credit spread tightening you know, at this point in time. And then I do like to add this just to give you a perspective you know, over the long term, you know, how the Morningstar US corporate bond market index, the spread has averaged you know, over time where we are today, and then a similar chart for you know, the high yield market. So again, you know, very, very few times, you know, have we really traded, you know, much tighter than this. So again, I do think it's, you know, an area that it's probably a neutral, you know, at this point in time, but I certainly wouldn't be overweight, you know, either investment grade or high yield at this point in time. Well, I'd like to thank Dave and Preston for their time today and thank everyone for joining Morningstar's first quarter 2024 U.S. stock market outlook webinar. Have a great day.